Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to the Cerebral Blood Flow Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Caroline Rickards. I'm from the University of North Texas Health Science Center in the US. And I'm joined today by my co-organizer and co-chair, uh, Patrice Brassard from the University of Laval in Canada. So as I say, welcome back to our uh, seminar series. We've had a, a, a break over the summer um, or the winter for those in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and we're back again for our, our series from now through till December. Um, as you can see on the screen here, we have four seminars, uh, just one once per month uh, this time around, uh, rather than uh, once every two weeks. So uh, a, a few less, but still very interesting series that we have for these next few months. Um, so today's uh, series is uh, focused on some new technologies that are that are um, being released uh, to assess cerebral blood flow and cerebral uh, oxygenation. Um, and so we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, just a few introductory slides, though, for you. Um, so for those of you who would like to join the Cerebral Order Regulation Research Network, there's some details here in terms of uh, how you can become a member of this network. Uh, we were established in 2010. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary community of researchers working on various aspects of cerebral blood flow regulation. Uh, then that includes uh, biomedical engineers, physiologists, and clinicians. So if you'd like to become a member of this group, um, please send me your CV. Um, there's no membership fee at this stage. Um, and our website is also listed here if you'd like to take a look and see what materials we have available. In terms of some of the rules of engagement for today, um, for those who have already been participating in this series, you'll be well versed in these uh, notes here, but we'd please ask you to keep your micro microphone on mute and your video off throughout the session. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of each presentation. If you have a question, you can e either raise your hand and then turn your microphone on once we ask you to do so, and you can ask your question uh, with, your, um, with your mic open. Or you can also post your question in the chat and either Pat or I will ask that question for you and then the speaker can respond. Um, this session is currently being recorded and will be posted on the Cerebral Auto Regulation, Auto Regulation Research Network website within the next few days. And as always, we really help, we really thank you for your support of this seminar series. Um, now coming up to the, uh, we're in the third, sem third semester now, so um, almost a year and a half of presenting these to you. All right. So moving on now to our session today, and I'm going to pass over to uh, Patrice, who will introduce our first speaker. So thanks, Pat. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Patrice Brassard from Université Laval in Quebec City, and I will uh, chair this uh, first uh, session. So the speaker for this uh, session will be Adam Ramakers, uh, who is a senior business director at the Delica, and the title of his talk will be Delica Next Generation TCD. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, my name is uh, Adam Ramakers, and I want to thank you, Professor uh, Rickard, and the organization committee for uh, allowing me to speak about the next generation TCD. I'm really honored also on behalf of uh, Delica Medical. So my name is Adam Ramakers. I started my career in the early 80s in nursing after finalizing some additional courses, coronary care, intensive care, and burn care. I got my degree in business administration. And I worked until in hospitals until 2005 as business unit manager of ICUs. 2005, I switched my career to the medical industry for sales rate position. And so since just more than a year, I'm working for a data medical system. So that's my introduction. And thank you for having me on board. So on the agenda of my presentation, I will shortly say something about Delica Medical history of TCD and the basic principles of TCD, but I will do it very shortly because the audience probably knows much more about it than I am. Then I will go into detail what, about the next generation TCD systems and particularly the 9F, the EMS 9M and the EMS 90 Pro. Some of the Delica innovative solutions, uh, the robotic Pro, 3D scanning and emily detection. So, Shenzhen Delica Medical Equipment, the company introduction was established in 1998 by President Mr. Richard Wong and is a national high-tech enterprise engaged in high-tech medical equipment research and development manufacturing. They are awarded several times on national level by the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology um, for innovative R&D capabilities, advanced technical level high market share, Delica is listed on the National Equities Exchange and Quotations, and their stock out is A37537. 
They moved to the new business premises earlier this year in July 2021 with a floor area of more than 5,400 square meters or 50, uh, 85,000 square feet. They hold over 200 employees. National high tech certification. They are ISO 13485, means they are allowed for manufacturing medical equipment. Of course, they have CEFDA and Delica has nine authorized inventions patents at the present. More than 10,000 clients internally in China, China mainland, including 500 territory A hospitals and the international market share is the top two. So heading over to the history and the principle of transcranial Doppler, I think this is all well known by you and uh, how the Doppler effect was invented by Christian Doppler. But then from physics, to TCD is a medical device. What a lot of people don't know maybe is that Dr. William Stang, founder of Nottingham, still a US company and a collaborator of Delica, um, together with Robert Barnes, first used a fast Fourier transfer to analyze the change in frequency uh, of the returned audio signals or ultrasound instruments. It was done by the Angio scan. And in fact, the Angio scan, that was the basis on which Rune Astley in 1982 uh, found out that it was possible to send an ultrasound beam into the brain through a thinning of the skull. Well, we all know this is the TCD. The article below is in which this is described in more detail. Well, we all are familiar with this picture of the spectral display in the indices, all what's based on TCD when we're looking to the DCD, the systolic peak, the end diastolic velocity, and the mean velocity, of course. The ultrasound in tissue, it emits and receives a signal when the probe sends a signal to the blood cell. Some fetch ultrasound travels at a constant speed of 1540 meters per second in tissue. It's a reflected environment to media and the ultrasound is backscattered in the heterogeneous tissues. And as high the ultrasound frequency as a higher resolution and the shallower the penetration of depth. Here you see it in sonography, ultrasound signals is used to insulate the vessels with two megahertz. The signals are reflected and backscatters from moving objects, blood cells with a positive or negative frequency shift, as we all know. The frequency shift is also called the Doppler shift or Doppler signal. As fast as the blood cells are moving, as higher the Doppler shift. And here you see that the quotational inaccuracy and an angle of 45% will be accepted. And what you see here is in fact, why does blood flow? Pressure is depending on compliance, competence, and peripheral resistance. As we all know, TCD works based on pressure difference, non-invasively relative to the sample volume. And by the difference in transmitting and receiving the signal, you can determine the, floods, the flow speed and the direction. That is stated here in formulas. And this is for me an important slide. This is about the multi-range Doppler. The multi-range technique, the pulse wave modes at different depths, it, it allows 3D reconstruction of the cerebral arteries at the base of the brain. This comes back in my presentation later on. Well, in general, uh, how to get a good spectrum quickly. It's about the amplitude, the power of the ultrasound, the gate, the sample volume, the gain, which enhances the intensity of color, which is done digitally, and it's more or less a way of photoshopping before. The, the M mode shows the depth of distribution of the signal and the acoustic signal. Well, talking now about Delica TCD innovative solutions, not covering other Delica solutions like multifunctional vascular and ultrasound or the digital EEG systems they also provide. In this presentation, I'm talking about three different types of transcranial doppers, the EMS-9F, the EMS-9M, and the EMS-9D Pro. And on the right side, you see the application areas in which they are used, neurology, cardiovascular surgeries, neuro ICUs, stroke units, research, 
and people like you, neurovegetarian studies, cardiology, and pediatrics. I'm going to the first system, the EMS 9F. It's a small, smart, digital, and high-quality TCD solution in a small box. You see the box over here on the, on the screen. Do you see my cursor, cursor as well? Yes. Okay. Well, it's some sort of a pizza box, and uh, it shipped uh, it shipped out without a PC because people buy that locally, and they can put it on a trolley. And this is an, uh, an examination uh, device for intracranial and extracranial vessels because... It has 1.6 and 2 MAVET sprouts, which are especially for intracranial vessels, and the 4 MAVET and the 8 MAVET sprouts are for extracranial vessels. And we have the 1.6 because we all know that some, and especially in elderly people, uh, sometimes it's very hard to get a good signal. And then with the 1.6, you will have more power to insulate. The 9M, this is a device, this is an ambulatory system uh, which works for intracranial pressure, intracranial vessels, because it allows only two MAVET probes, but uh, monitor normal probes, handheld probes, but also the robotic probes, uh, which I will cover later on. It is a battery powered. It's a, a to use uh, together with the robotic probes, it can work for two and a half hours. And you can see you can also walk around with it. That means you can also use it as an altar. Uh, how to connect it? You can connect it by ESB directly to a laptop. You can use LAN. And uh, for that, you have uh, a very long distance. But it also can operate on, on Wi Fi to a PC or to a laptop. So this means it's also for, uh, for physiology, if you do uh, research in an environment on the treadmill or on the bicycle, you can, uh, you can use it uh, as an ambulatory system. And then uh, last, the EMS 9D Pro. It's an all-in-one TCD capable of connecting with the external devices, such as continuous non-invasive blood pressure and tidal CO2, ECG, ICM. It's a light system as well it's about uh, seven uh, kilograms 6.4 kilograms and um this is the, the the system which is used a lot as a multi uh, multi-model neuro monitoring system because all the connectivities you can have on this system and for instance uh, you can connect it uh, i think the people uh, in this audience they know continuous non invasive blood pressure like the company FMS or the company CN systems. And together with ICM Plus from the, Cambridge, the Brain and Physics Lab in Cambridge, you can do multi parameter integration. You can have the non invasive intracranial pressure evaluation. This is, of course, not the gold standard because that is invasive, but it is nice for trend information. Uh, all other devices, which has an analog interface or digital interface, we can connect. And I know that one of the next speakers is NIRS, and I know they are working on, uh, on connectivity with analog as well. So there are a lot of additional hard and software possibilities in hardware, the robotic probes, which is the main topic after this, and Title CO2, uh, any hardware solutions, which provides analog or digital interface, well, the 9D Pro is a multi-modality solution I mentioned already, Dicom interface, software. We are unique that we can offer peer-reviewed hits. That's the only company who has peer review. It's Emily detection available, which comes back later on. 3D scanning, the ICM Plus Cambridge Brain and Physics Lab, an integration by CSV files, Excel, or people you work with MATLAB can use it as well actually based on the Windows 10 platform and also in software with the DICOM. Well, and this is, I think, very important to good understand. And I think why this is very unique, uh, what we have on the daily TCD in our next generation TCDs. It's also tested by the group of Cambridge. You see the, the article below from Tyler and Smielski in Critical Ultrasound from 2018. 
in which they described that for a long lasting signal for over four hours, it was very accurate. It's accurate, easy to use, save times, repeatability and stability. But what is more important, it allows automatic temporal window finder, automatic optical MCL signal finder and continuous tracing of the uh, optimal signal during long-term monitoring. <laughs> Here you see some examples. This, I saw short movies behind. Here you see that it is working with the servo motor. He clicks scanning. And then you see how the robotic probe scans the area in the temporal window. And it also changes the angle. If you believe this is very important because there's a lot of people who are used to work with TCD. It takes up from five to 10 minutes to find a good signal. And the robotic probe is a unique feature. This helps you to have the signal within two or three minutes. Now we scan the complete area and then you see their part is green and okay, we'll go to the next one. This is the scan function. This, uh, this function allows automatically to perform a general scan of the window. In order to find the signal you're looking for, the feature allows you to choose from higher intensity, best signal, or highest velocity. And that's particularly important in clinical settings like stenosis and vasospasm. You can also select the angle scan and the software can also change automatically a bit the depth uh, in order to, uh, to take a better signal. If you have multiple points with signals, you can click with the mouse uh, the one you prefer. And you see the green dots on the screen and you can click and also you will search in that area automatically. Then we go to the search function. Once you found the signal and scan, you can press search. It performs a high resolution search in the surrounding areas. And the best signal uh, you may have in a relationship to the window where you put the probes and the other parameters you select, the depth, uh, the gain and the gates. Yes, here you see the search function. And you can hear. If you press the search, it performs a high resolution search in the surrounding areas. That's what I mentioned in the previous one. So the robotic probe can scan the complete area or with the search function, you can find it on a point you are working, let's see if no. This is about stability. We all know that sometimes when patients or subjects are moving their head, it is very easy to lose the signal. And here on this video, you saw that it is very stable, very rigid. And it's very hard also because of the headband of the robotic probe is very firm and very well uh, positioned on the head. And this last short video about the robotic probe is about the bilateral uh, function. Once you found the signal on the first channel, you can check the second channel. 
and following the same steps, you may find very quickly the signal on the other side. What normally takes five to 10 minutes, this is done within one to two minutes. Well, going to the other innovative solutions, um, I said in the earlier in this presentation about um, the way we can, uh, with, with uh, Pulse Wave, we can go in depth. It's uh, the 3D software available on the Emus 9D Pro. You see on the left-hand side, you see the different depths, and here you see a picture of an image which is calculated mathematically by using the 3D scanning. And sorry, I have a little movie again, and I will turn off the music of this one to very slow, very. So, heading over from the movies, those this is in the past now. Uh, my last topic about this, the innovative solutions is uh, is about uh, peer-reviewed embry detection software, and also the article which I refer to is mentioned below in this uh, in this article. Uh, this EDS is peer-reviewed uh, certified embryo detection software with a, with a built-in artificial intelligence. Uh, which allows a rapid diagnosis of solid embryo in long-term time series. And here you see uh, it's high intensity transits uh, and two examples of embryo, a single solid gaseous embryo, which you can see on the picture here below it's uh, zero crossing line, very stable, it's very frequent. You see the embryos over here. And here you see the gaseous, which moves around the vessel completely. And on the other side, you see two finds of artifacts, the movement artifacts, 
which has a completely different pattern and also a speech artifact. And of course, there are also other artifacts. Uh, think about, uh, especially in uh, during surgery, uh, when diatomy is uh, used. Well, this is about some unique features I think uh, Delica has to offer and which makes us the next generation uh, of transcranial dopper. Um, our values are customer oriented, close collaboration, practical, open minded, and enterprising, which are also to mention the, the goals of the, the company. More innovative solutions are on the roadmap, which cannot be disclosed right now at the moment. Uh, but please follow us on, on LinkedIn and Twitter for uh, uh, our future uh, developments. So, Thank you all for your attention and any questions, please feel free. And I'm just exactly in the time, I think. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> so we already have a few questions. So the discussion period should be interesting. So the first question from Rani Panrai, can the EMS 9M accept other signals to be combined with servo blood flow velocity, for example, ECG or phenometer output? So the EMS 9M. That's a very good question. Uh, no, it cannot like the EMS 9D. It cannot incorporate the signals, but of course you can extract the data. And uh, if you have your CSV files, and what I know that most of you people are working with other systems, so some sort of data acquisition systems. And if you work with CSV, Excel, or there are a lot of uh, MATLAB experts, I think you can combine it, but you cannot feed in the signals into the EMS 9. And if that's the question, Okay, thanks. Uh, second uh, question from Dr. Panrai, and I also have that the, the same. Does the robotic probe work well with the PCA? With the PCA, what's mean with the PCA? The posterior cerebral artery, because you focused on the yeah. middle cerebral artery. Um, yeah, but but yes, that that's good. But you saw also in the picture it it shows in depth, so you see the different depths. But uh, never never forget that TCD was mainly um, developed for the MCA, uh, but because of the um, we, we can make a picture build up from the different layers inside the brain. So, 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 so it works with, with PC, PC as well. Um, it depends on the, on the depth and the parameters. So yes, you can, you, you, yeah, but would say you can search for it. Okay. And, and a follow up question from Shek Seng. What about the ACA, the anterior cerebral artery? Well, it's, it's, it's also, of course, um, um, the robotic probes are here. So that's, but I think that's, that's the, um, it, I, think, I think the answer is the same. If you, if you look for it uh, and, and you find a signal, you can do it. And building up this 3D image, uh, because you saw it was speeded up in this short movie, but it takes and normally it will take about three to four minutes, but you can do it several times during a me measurement, of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it just and, and to, to find it, you can just uh, put the probe a bit forward in the window and then maybe and you will find it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Carolyn Rickards, uh, I have a question as well. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you have a, uh, to identify the desired depth or does the system also adjust for this automatically? Oh, that's a very good question. Well, what it, uh, what it does, it finds the highest velocity or uh, the best signal or the, uh, so that it does, and you can choose for either of, the, of them. And then it's depending on which vessel you're looking to, but uh, normally it will, it will find for the, um, it desires depth as a start, but the system adjusts uh, it just later on. Mm -hmm. okay. Next question from AJ Rosenberg. Thank you very much for your presentation. Does the EMF, uh, EMS 9F have two analog output channels? And what is the appropriate cost of the EMS 9F system with probes and software? Um, that's a very good question, but uh, the, the cost is it's an easy question. It's depending on which territory. I only are familiar with transfer prices. And of course, we have global partners and global partners. Uh, they uh, are depending on their uh, local roles, the local cost. So I don't know what end user prices are in different territories. 
and, and does the EMS uh, 9F have two analog output channels? Eight. Okay. Uh, next uh, question, Thomas Vincent, uh, do you have other more lightweight caps that would allow placement of other devices like NIRS or in the context of cranial surgery? So please uh, say that, ask that question uh, again, please. Yeah, sorry. Uh, do you have uh, other more lightweight caps that would allow a placement of other devices or in the context of cranial surgery? Yeah, and what, what other devices, what's meant by other devices? Well, for intracranial surgery, what I mentioned, uh, people use uh, 60 megahertz probes and they, they are sterile as well, but I'm not sure what, what is meant um, uh, by other devices or small caps. The, the robotic probes are as they are. And I know that, uh, well, they're, they're not that bulky, they're, they're good and they stay, they stay fit. Okay, is it, yeah, Thomas, maybe you could open your microphone and complete the question if, uh, or not. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up to the next question. Uh, maybe a next, uh, a last one. Uh, uh, Alvar Goldbranson, thank you for the presentation. Does the robot only use pulse wave mode? And if so, what is the range of thermal index usually during scan period? That is a very good question. And I must say, I'm not sure if I, if I can have this question and, and uh, by, by email, I will, uh, I will answer it. Um, this is a technical question. I, am, I cannot answer at the moment. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, a last one for me. <laughs> Is it possible for the robotic probe to, uh, at some point, lose the signal in, in the middle of an experiment? And if so, is it possible or how, it, it, how the machine will react at some point if we are losing the signal? Well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, in fact, when uh, you, you saw it, when, uh, when my colleague on the movie, he changed it, he moved the, the probe a little bit, he, with, with this function, he will automatically go back to, to, the, to the lost signal and he will find the signal for you again. So and that's uh, we know that this that sometimes it's uh, this could be a problem during carotid surgery when the surgeon is moving over and putting uh, but you have to put a lot of force on it but then if you just put it back a little bit it will auto search again for the best signal. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ramaker. So I think uh, Caroline will move on to uh, the next session. Thank you. Uh, one last remark that, that is called okay. what I mentioned, the track function, and uh, we can choose the percentage of loss of signal, and then it will automatically uh, find it again. And the, you can put it in 15 or 30 percent loss of the signal, and then, we, and then it will auto track the signal again. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you for, uh, for having me on board. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pat, and thank you to, to Adam for presenting uh, on behalf of Delica. Um, so we're moving on now to the next presentation uh, today. So we have uh, Sergei Obrukov, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer from Wellumio, um, which is a company out of New Zealand. Um, and he'll also be joined for the question time from Shek Zeng, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Wellumio. Um, so Sergei, I'm going to pass over to you now. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for having uh, uh, myself um, uh, at this webinar. Okay, uh, so Volumio is a, uh, a very new company. Our logo hasn't <laughs> dried the, the paint back on, but we've been working on um, this technology for with Shia for five or six years together. Um, and just to kind of start the talk and uh, motivate why we developed this technology. Uh, why does does the world need more devices to um, study the brain? I think is pretty easy one to answer uh, by this audience. But uh, we'll start with motivating the talk essentially through a stroke uh, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, well, <laughs> why not? A stroke is an issue that affects the brain quite drastically. And drastically. And the second of all is um, I already had the slides. Uh, so thank you very much again for having me here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so as uh, everybody here is aware that the stroke is a global problem and it affects um, many people, uh, millions of people over the year. 
and it's a leading cause of disability around the world and probably a good chance that somebody here knows or um, have been either affected by someone who have suffered a stroke so it's a uh, uh, can be quite a uh, disability uh, disabilitating uh, and, and, and sudden change of people losing their freedom to uh, essentially losing their freedom and in order to try to solve the uh, and um, solve the issue with stroke and try to um, treat the stroke as soon as possible you essentially you see a lot of uh, recovery happening much faster if you actually do the treatment within the, um, the golden hour and in order to do that, uh, you have to essentially kind of first diagnose what type of stroke it is, if it's an ischemic stroke, if it's an occlusion, uh, or if it's hemorrhagic, because obviously the uh, two paths of treatment are very, uh, very, uh, very drastically different. In one, you try to dissolve the, uh, the clot by delivering a drug to, or actually mechanically retrieving it, and the other one, you manage it completely different, have to manage the uh, blood pressure, try to stop the bleeding, and uh, giving the patient a TPA can actually kill them. So as the standard um, practice of care, the gold standard practice of care, MRI used to be uh, the tool of choice for a lot of uh, neurologists to diagnose a, a diagnose a stroke. The uh, soft tissue contrast that MRI provides is just absolutely phenomenal. But just due to accessibility, CT have um, taken over in the past 10 or 12 years. And a CT scan, uh, it's much easier available in most hospitals. You can get a CT scan uh, ordered and, and completed in uh, 15 minutes versus, uh, you know, waiting for maybe uh, a slot in the MRI system to actually uh, get the uh, get your images and, and process them. And uh, if you can see the CT image, what actually clinicians will see um, is instead of a, uh, a soft tissue damage, they're actually going to be looking for a tiny little clot, this hypo-intense region uh, of the MC artery here. Well, this is not the same patient, by the way, but you know, with the MRI, um, a diffusion image could actually show you quite a lot of information um, uh, about the, the extent of the damage to the uh, surrounding area. Um, so in order to um, speed up the treatment, try to deliver the, treat, uh, the, the treatment within the golden hour, what people usually do is um, and if you're lucky enough to live in a, a big city that actually have a mobile stroke unit, they have been putting these CT scanners uh, into ambulances and taking them to a um, uh, to the patient, so they can uh, scan, diagnose, and actually deliver a TPA. So um, this is kind of the uh, the 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 the, um, uh, the the state of the art technology that's available for stroke. And this is kind of really interesting that, you know, for, for heart, you actually have uh, smart ECG and uh, AED devices that can uh, automatically uh, deliver a pulse, uh, treat a patient right there, save a person's lives, right? And uh, the ambulatory uh, services, they can deliver a TPA, the same drug that's used for strokes, for a person who's having a heart attack, they actually can deliver it in the ambulances. So there's a really disparity in solutions for the, available for the brain try to diagnose um, uh, and, and be able to, to treat uh, a patient within that golden hour window. And, you know, just to, um, so some of these mobile stroke ambulances don't make sense in, in, in large areas. They're only available in, in, in cities. So if you are somewhere in the rural areas, they don't make cost effective sense. And um, they're still using, you know, um, CT technology, which is ionizing radiation. So you cannot use the uh, CT for a lot of uh, brain monitoring or follow-up. If you need it, you need it. Let's see. Okay. So I'm here to talk to you guys about the uh, an, a magnetic resonance device that we have developed. And um, um, if anybody in the audience uh, uses MRI, uh, I know that it's very hard to argue about the uh, relevance of MRI and how much it can actually do. You know, it just doesn't provide structural and volumetric information of the brain, uh, a fantastic soft uh, gray white matter tissue. It can do a lot of uh, interesting physiological measurements as well too, if you have access to it, right? <laughs> that's, the key, uh, that's the key word. It can do a lot of uh, 
flow measurements, not just uh, three dimensional and uh, with, with, the, uh, with the time domain, right? Uh, you can do angiography, look at the blockage of the vessels, uh, can measure perfusion uh, in the tissue. You can look at the actual functional studies of the brain by looking at the bold signal changes, uh, getting people to you know, look at the activation of the brain. Um, the uh, microstructural information is also available by using things like diffusion weighted imaging and diffusion tensor imaging, which is uh, incredible tools that were able to uh, make a lot of discoveries about the uh, about the brains in the past uh, uh, 20 years or so. Um, and also uh, the amazing thing to me uh, is that MRI is also can provide metabolic information in, in real time as well too. So a distribution of uh, metabolites um, for diagnosing cancer, for example, or a, uh, we actually can look at the uh, changes in metabolomics um, throughout the cancer treatments and things. So it's a very powerful technique. And uh, MRI as well too is a, you know, it's, it's something that has been in reinventing itself every 10 years or so. There's new contrast techniques are coming out um, every few years and it's very hard to argue that it's, it's not a useful tool. The big question though that you can argue is, well, it's it's accessibility point, right? Can it be cheaper? Can it be more accessible? Can we do things faster? Uh, and can it provide more value? Right? And the biggest question to uh, uh, with stroke, for example, right, is where can it be where you need it when you need it? Right? And the fact is that it just it's it is advanced technology, uh, and uh, over ninety percent of the world just doesn't have access to MRI systems. And depends where you are in the world as well too. The problems are uh, different. So in the uh, uh, in in the US, uh, for example, uh, the overprescription of MRI. You know, most MRI systems actually are done on, on healthy subjects, so they're not prescribed uh, properly. In eleven countries in Africa, there's just no uh, no scanners. There's lack of education and training to use those systems. In uh, Australia and New Zealand, we have a shortage of uh, radiologists. And Technicians to uh, that add to wait times to operate the systems, and uh, you know, in, in, in large uh, areas where population is very uh, distributed, it's actually very hard to put a scanner where you, where you need it. So um, we are based in uh, Wellington, New Zealand, uh, very far from. Well, actually, we like to think of it as a uh, everything is equally far away from us, so we're in the center. Uh, in New Zealand, we have been uh, developing magnetic resonance technologies for about 40 years or so. Uh, so this is a uh, Sir Paul Callahan. He's a uh, relatively uh, famous MR physicist that uh, I have moved to do my postdoc with. And they've been uh, thinking very differently about magnetic resonance. Um, for them, it's just a, it's not just a clinical system that you can use. It also can be a uh, uh, a tool that can be used for industrial applications or for, for research. Uh, so one of the first um, uh, and, and the most interesting applications that uh, our lab has done um, is uh, taken an MRI system, an earth field MRI system uh, that operates at five Gauss uh, out to Antarctic to study uh, sea ice. Now it's a uh, <laughs> kind of an extreme fun thing to do, but also we have been developing all kinds of uh, different uh, magnets for different applications, uh, industrial applications such as uh, oil and gas world core analysis, uh, educational MRI systems, and um, also these, um, you know, some devices that are just can be used just as sensors, just the size of the palm of your hand. And of course, a, a benchtop and MRI systems that can be used for educational and chemistry. Uh, it's also a, uh, been developed here. Um, the other uh, thing that we are, uh, we have a very good uh, high temperature superconductivity uh, group in New Zealand as well too. And we've been pioneering a lot of development of new type of magnets that can be, don't have the same requirements as uh, clinical MRI systems, which usually use a uh, uh, very cold cryogenic liquids that have to uh, be expelled during a quench. So something when the MRI goes something goes wrong with the magnet it has to be expelled uh, outside of the room so um, by getting rid of these uh, cryogens you can install these magnets in in a lot more um, a lot more locations and 
the good thing is that it's not only New Zealand that's thinking about how to make uh, uh, MRI more accessible. All over the world, there is a commercial efforts that are happening uh, at this stage. So there's a Canadian co a company called Synaptic Medical and an American company called Hyperfine. They're developing these uh, systems that are uh, can be, you know, uh, be placed in uh, ICUs and uh, emergency departments to uh, uh, to be able to scan the patients when when they are coming in. So it is a very exciting time for magnetic resonance technology. And um, yeah, just a little kind of story. I, I, I've, I've helped out Synaptic Medical with uh, this particular magnet here, and now it's currently installed in a. Um, uh, QE2 in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So it's uh, uh, my hometown, <laughs> and uh, my mom. My mom works with the uh, 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 in the same hospital. So it's pretty uh, pretty interesting. Interesting that you can make an, uh, such a, a long distance contribution to the uh, to your hometown from far away. Um, so superconducting magnets. Uh, in order to kind of make them more accessible, people have been taking two approaches, either using superconducting magnets and making them less, uh, not as strong as your clinical systems, or go with permanent magnet designs and uh, make them uh, uh, smaller and more portable. Unfortunately, though, none of these systems are still uh, in a quite a portable category. There are still about 800 and 700 kilos so it's not something that you can um, uh, put easily in ambulance. And uh, the, uh, some of the, as far as the strength field is concerned, the higher you go in strength, the, the heavier the magnet's gonna be. Right, so in order to understand the challenges of the MRI accessibility, I thought about actually talk a little bit about, uh, about physics and what makes MRI tick just to kind of um, uh, give you guys a bit of a, uh, a prime example of um, what can be thrown essentially out from the magnet in order to uh, still give you useful information. MRI is based on a, um, on spin physics. So this is a, we're interrogating a nucleus of a, um, protons usually, and the protons can be parts of uh, water, hydrogen, um, attached to um, lipids or other chemicals. And uh, when you place the protons in a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field, you can, they, they, they split into energy levels. They have uh, a quantum property called spin. And you getting the signals are out of MRI by essentially bombarding it using the uh, RF photons, radio frequency photons. And uh, by essentially kind of uh, perturbing these energy levels, you can um, get your signal back out and it's picked up using radio frequency coils. And this works at the a specific resonance frequency uh, and that specific resonance frequency is specifically tied to your, to your magnetic field. So in order to generate an image, what people do is they generate first a nice homogeneous magnetic field and it's incredibly homogeneous. I mean, it's, we're talking about parts per million. Um, so all the spins in the body, in the patient's body, have to resonate the same at, at within one to ten ppm of um, of resolution. Right, so it's it's within uh, ten to fifty hertz. Sort of, uh, and in order to generate an image, what people do is they uh, generate these uh, linear gradients in x, y, and z direction. And when you apply these uh, spatially encoding gradients, you make the spins in the right arm or left arm to resonate at slightly different frequencies. So this is how you spatially encode the, uh, spatially encode the uh, different locations and use RF coils to pick that up and generate a two-dimensional image. And if you're familiar with MRI scans, um, they actually come with different contrasts. You can have white matter, gray matter look different. Do you see a self look different? And that essentially, because you are dealing with spins on a, a molecular uh, environment, right? So um, by the way you probe, by the way you vary your RF pulses and gradient pulses, you can probe the different uh, mechanisms which, with which the spins uh, live in the molecular environment and, 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 and undergo the molecular motion. Right, 
So if you are generating a large magnetic field, you need a magnet, right? So this is a, a size of a typical 1.5 clinical MRI uh, system. If you're lucky enough to uh, have a, a really high field research MRI system, uh, so this is kind of size comparison. It's probably actually, I try to match them as close as possible, but there's a person inside here, 11.4T uh, research MRI system. There is only one at, uh, currently available in the, in, in the world. It's a, um, uh, I believe it's in France. And um, they're fantastic tools. It's essentially a Hubble <laughs> space telescope equivalent for the brain. <clears throat> they're all great, but in the end, you will get just a single snapshot of the image while the patient is inside the magnet. And uh, what people actually do is 90% uh, of that image is actually being discarded. People are usually interested in just part of the brain that. Uh, they are studying, right? So a lot of information that's being presented in publications would be when dealing with regions of interests and uh, a new information essentially can be gathered parts by parts and the rest of the image is not really being used. So um, the question really begs, do you really need an image? Right? And um, there's some quotes by uh, Dr. Mark Parsons, we've been working with him uh, as the president of Stroke uh, Society of Australasia is that, well, it's not really the image, it's, um, you know, we know the anatomy, it's information in the image that's actually more important. Um, and what really it can, comes down to is clinical researchers and clinicians, they don't really, what they really need is an ability to pick inside. And you are very familiar and uh, a good crowd to give you guys an example of, um, of people that need such, such solutions. So over the past five years, we've been focusing on providing um, clinical researchers uh, with quantitative metrics to diagnose and monitor uh, brain. And of course, you know, our technology is based on uh, magnetic resonance, but uh, we have had been inspired by a, uh, industrial applications and porting them into medical, uh, medical space. So Oil and gas industry would love to use MRI to actually be able to find oil and gas deposits, right? But it's impossible to build an MRI system around the earth and actually image the entire core of the earth and locate different deposits. Right? So the solution for them has been to uh, design these um, uh, well drilling uh, apparatus where the MRI works in inside out manner. And what I mean by inside out matter is that magnetic field is projected outside of the actual device. And as the, uh, this, um, uh, the probe is being dropped down the earth core, you can do the same measurements that you do in MRI. Um, uh, and as, as you go down deep, uh, deep into the, uh, deep into your, into your well. And what people usually use this for is to measure things like a, um, T2, T1, uh, and diffusion. So this is a uh, MR relaxation parameters and a molecular motion with just something very, very simple. And by looking at the depth and profiles of this, they can essentially say, okay, we have oil deposits in certain locations. We understand how the porosity of the rock works so we can start extracting them. And uh, the way they uh, have designed these magnets is essentially, well, if you know, clinical MRI systems uh, put a person inside the magnet? What if we actually just open it up and start doing it uh, just on the outside? Or you can actually kind of, you know, uh, have just a single bar magnet as you lower it down, you can do images on the on the side of the wall here. So depending on the application, you can actually design your magnets to, to do quite a lot of things. You just have to be kind of um, open-minded to what you're actually getting out of your MR uh, signal. And there are some commercially available devices that you can now purchase. Uh, Booker manufactures a mini spec uh, system, uh, New Zealand company Megatech. We also designed these uh, several mouse probes. And uh, whether you know or not, but the uh, uh, Beijing and Shanghai metro systems they actually have these uh, liquid sc screeners uh, throughout their entire metro system to actually uh, look at the water and fluids that people are bringing in. There's uh, quite a few books that have been written about this technology, and mostly they've been used for a um, 
uh, for industrial applications. So looking at uh, oil and gas industry, but also curing of epoxies, uh, rubbers and uh, processes in, in, in food and dairy, for example. Um, there are some biomedical applications. So since about 2001, 2007 or so, people have been interested in looking at uh, commercial using commercial devices to uh, study things like a, a tendon looking at the skin so the commercial devices don't have a really large penetration depth some have been designing customary custom devices that have been looking at the pulmonary function looking at the water collection in the lungs as well as a, our group of publishing uh, for bone um, porosity so uh, and as well too, there's a, uh, an Australian group that's been looking at the breast tissue density of the uh, uh, excised tissue to see if they can uh, use it as a, another marker to um, for, for diagnosis of breast cancer. So what our approach is, is essentially is uh, very similar to a uh, oil and gas industry. We like to think of uh, things a little bit different. We want to simplify MRI as much as possible and miniaturize device to where it becomes portable and accessible. So we like to think of Oxana as MR-based stethoscope for the brain. Right? It provides you the same signals that you get from MRI, but instead of getting you an image, you just get a uh, information from a swing, uh, single focal point. Uh, we call it a sweet spot. And what that allows you to do is um, we can do continuous monitoring, right? That's something you cannot do with MRI. You cannot leave a person there for four or five hours and continually scan them. Um, it also makes the device portable. You can reposition the sweet spot and look at different locations in the brain. Unlike MRI, our system is completely uh, silent, so it doesn't use any gradients. Uh, we use a lot of in in internal gradients. Uh, to do some some interesting measurements, and uh, because it's a, a low magnetic field and a small magnet, it's 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 much safer than a large magnet. So you don't have to have um, devices that are uh, MR compatible exactly to, to be used with. What we really wanted to design is a device for comprehensive neuro monitoring uh, measurements. So if we look at this graph here, we have a uh, on one side MRIs, fantastic for. Um, doing a lot of work on, in the brain. Uh, we have CT uh, and we have for portability scale is in, in y-axis, right? So we have things like uh, mirrors and microwave and EEG systems um, on the other scale. So there is actually quite a, quite a large gap between those two. And what we want to do is get, um, to come up with a device that has same specificity as MRI uh, but a lot more portable than what's actually currently available. So talking to uh, Shiak and clinicians, you know, the important uh, parameters that we can get out of the brain, things like tissue oxygenation was very important, you know, for diagnosing early signs of ischemia. Uh, we want to look at the uh, diffusion, uh, edema, uh, and stroke progression. A, uh, another thing that's um, interesting is perfusion information as well, too. So tissue oxygenation is uh, what people are familiar with from functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's a based on bold um, uh, effect, blood oxygen level dependent. And uh, we work with essentially a, uh, the fact that iron in hemoglobin has different permagnetic susceptibility. So it changes the uh, uh, T2 relaxation of the, uh, of, the, of, the blood, of the water around the blood cells. And uh, we benchmark our system uh, against a, uh, just a, um, uh, a ex vivo sample of blood being oxygenated and deoxygenated in ex vivo circuit versus in years. And you can see that um, uh, it follows quite well. And even after, uh, um, so there is a, a model to how the signal behaves. And if we actually use all the uh, different echo times that we're measuring uh, our T2 with, Put that in the model, we can actually trace it out against the C, uh, against nearest technology, and the oxygenation actually behaves quite well. Um, and of course, you know, doing it just in next vivos um, is not good enough. Uh, usually, people want to see it working on a real animal model. So, we've been uh, showed a, a tissue oxygenation on a global hypoxia uh, animal model. 
where we essentially kind of uh, went through a uh, uh, modulating tile volume of a, of a sheep and uh, position our device. So this is what our device research device looks like. Uh, position over a uh, uh, sheep's head, sheep's brain. Uh, and we also used a Lycox probe uh, implanted in the brain to do simultaneous measurements. And the, interestingly enough that the, uh, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the signal is tracking very well in time uh, to what we're measuring directly in the brain from the uh, P, from the Lycox uh, probe. And here, the uh, Lycox probe just essentially kind of ran out of uh, battery. And they're uh, very prone to, to failure as well, too. Uh, for diffusion, uh, if um, um, you're not familiar with what diffusion measurements are, uh, it's essentially kind of a measurement of mean free path of molecules. So a, um, uh, what that kind of physiologically means is that uh, a low concentration of um, gel where it's something more viscous, will have a high apparent diffusion coefficient, or ADC. It's liquid, it's, uh, liquidy things essentially are have high ADC. High concentration gels uh, will have low ADC. So things like a uh, scar tissue, for example, um, restricts the water diffusion, so it will have a, uh, a low ADC. And uh, I, I thought this crowd would be more familiar with the Western block, but right? it's essentially the same idea where you have a, uh, a DNA chunks in different sizes and they are diffusing in electrical field. So smaller molecules will diffuse faster than larger ones, right? So that's essentially what MRI can do is we can look at the diffusion of molecules um, um, in, 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 in tissue. And um, just to kind of, as a proof of principle, you know, not just doing it in gels, but actually doing it on the brain. Uh, we've partnered up with the uh, um, Adelaide University to run through their surgical stroke model by a, occluding an MCA. And what we have done is put our device pre-surgery. Um, the animal was scanned using MRI uh, to give us a diffusion wave image. So we put our lo device location over uh, a certain area, and then we do a measurement uh, two hours post MCA occlusion, and you actually can see that there is a diffusion change and a uh, T2 change. And this is kind of a, a fingerprint of what's happening within the tissue. And you can pick that up with our device. Just this is our device is picking up the, the information from a, from a queen spot from a, a single uh, location. And uh, another interest um, uh, that would that you might may have is a uh, uh, you know, measurements of perfusion. So to see if there's a, a blood flow. So in MRI and CT, perfusion is usually measured using a contrast agent. Um, but it's impractical for our device, especially if you want to do monitoring. So what we have done uh, is develop a tagging technique. Um, MRI has a, a similar thing that is contrast, doesn't use contrast agents called uh, arterial spin labeling. So what we, essentially what we do is we um, uh, look at the, uh, we tag the blood in a certain region in the tissue and look how it washes in into uh, a different region in, 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 in our sampling volume. And from comparing those two, we can essentially figure out how much uh, fresh blood is flowing in and, and measure perfusion from that. Um, so this is what our device can do just in the uh, in vivo, uh, in muscle. Uh, we had a quick little paradigm where we just done muscle activation and uh, our signal is essentially kind of, we can see that the uh, uh, signal intensity is changing with uh, the way we expect it to. So I have a couple more minutes to talk to you guys about the uh, ischemic stroke trials that we underwent through over 13 sheep. And the idea here is that um, to kind of benchmark our system for uh, against an MRI for all three parameters at the same time against an MRI system. Um, so we had about uh, 12 or 13 sheep um, that had their MCA uh, um, arteries occluded. Some were done via a um, uh, permanently and some were done via transient stroke model. So a clip was applied for a period of time and then removed. <clears throat> for a permanent stroke, uh, we have measured for a, we couldn't measure it during an actual surgery procedure, but we have um, got some points uh, prior to the, to the actual stroke. 
um, then were measured for about four hours after the stroke, and then the uh, the animals were um, given MRI. And um, you can you can see directly that the ADC measurements values went down. This is an MRI image. Um, and this is essentially what we're picking up our signal from. And so this is a time domain signal that we're getting from our device. And this is NMRI data, right? This is where essentially we're picking that up. So ADC goes down and we see a uh, high point tense region in the MRI. It's only a single snapshot, right? <laughs> uh, replacement fraction is what we uh, term the perfusion measurements. Um, so there is a decrease in permanent stroke and you can see a, a change in perfusion uh, weighted image in the, uh, on the MRI that is uh, as well too. Uh, for T2, same thing. We have a hypo evaluation between um, the, the this, is, this is our healthy side, right? So there is a hypo intense region and we actually see a T2 uh, changes uh, in there as well too. And even more, more interestingly, we're actually, uh, we're able to see a transient stroke progression in, in real time. So uh, same thing was done. Um, we had a uh, an aneurysm clipped uh, place in MCA, and we can see the same thing happening. ADC decreases, and then after aneurysm is uh, removed, actually bounces back up. So as far as MRI is concerned, nothing have happened to the brain. You're not going to pick that up, uh, that damage up, until the scar tissue starts forming. Um, for the uh, perfusion, same thing as well too. We see in real time after when MCA is occluded, we see a decrease in perfusion, and then uh, it bounces back up after a while. So MRI, um, MRI just picks a um, an MRI things look pr pretty fine on both sides. It actually missed the the biggest change, right? Because we got the image at the end essentially of the entire experiments. Same thing with T2. There was a um, not much kind of um, uh, change observed uh, on our device and, and MRI. So we're tracking very well uh, to essentially kind of demonstrate our technology and, and against against an MRI system. And um, I'm going to just start finishing up by saying that you know it's a pleasure to introduce Axana uh, to this audience with our goal is to miniaturize MR technology and provide real-time information at the point of care. So we really think that this has got a real potential to revolutionize the way the, uh, the stroke is uh, actually being treated if we can get the device into the ambulances. And uh, as far as research uh, audience is concerned, uh, well, it's, it can also be used as a, a turnkey solution. Um, people can run their experiments in the lab. It doesn't expect, you know, without really needing an MRI compatible equipment or actually paying um, thousands of dollars for MRI rental time. Um, this is what our device looks like. We use um, an electronics board box and everything else is done in a uh, essential like uh, via Wi-Fi. Um, Right. So, of course, uh, we have a large team working on this. I'd like to acknowledge all, uh, uh, everybody. It's a considered effort from clinical researchers, MRI physicists, MRI engineers, uh, and uh, our collaborative advisory team in Canada and Australia as well, too. So, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sergei. Um, that was a really interesting presentation on the very novel um, a uh, uh, piece of equipment that we could use in our research uh, setting. So thank you for that. Um, so there's no questions yet in the chat, but uh, and I think uh, Shek is going to join us too for the question time if he needs to chip in for responses. Yep, <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. Actually, here we go. We've got a couple coming in here. Um, so a question from Nick Elleveld. Um, thank you for interesting presentation. Regarding the ischemic versus hemorrhagic stroke, stroke case, can the system specifically recognize hemorrhage? This is something we haven't actually proven uh, yet. We haven't gone through the animal trials yet, but uh, it's 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 a uh, it's uh, um, it's a future research. Absolutely. 
that was Nick. Nick got my question before I was able to ask it because I, I had the same question because that was one of your one of your statements at the beginning, right? In terms of the the risks of giving TPA um, to somebody who doesn't need it, um, in terms of exacerbating the hemorrhage. So, um, yeah, that'd be great to see that data. Um, next question from Justin Sprick. A very interesting presentation. Thank you. How are the analyses performed from data collected within this system? For example, for a ASL, the data analysis is quite complex and often requires an MR physicist to be on board to assist. Are there data analysis pipelines that are built into this software to assist with analysis? That's right. So um, as, as, as I've mentioned, we're a relatively new company. Um, uh, a lot of things that we do is we try to leverage as much open source software as possible. Um, so uh, for research purposes, what we're doing is uh, using a lot of Python, our own uh, um, software. But um, just to kind of give you an example is because we're not dealing with a lot of images, uh, we're just dealing with a single data set, right? Um, the, 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 the complexity of the pipeline is much simpler. Um, so what we're gonna be giving clinicians is essentially gonna be diffusion and um, and uh, perfusion data information straight out of it, right? So T2 is pretty straightforward. So the only thing we actually, that has to be done is uh, calibration. So we have calibration fluids that can be placed on the device and measured before or after. And we also run a lot of calibration information, um, getting kind of recalibrating it as the system runs on, 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 the, on the tissue as well too. So we're not calibrating everything but certain parameters we're calibrating as, as the as we're taking the measurements so um if i'll just move the so slides ju yeah just on just to add one thing so yes uh, what we would be doing is building out software to analyze all these things i mean our, our, our goal is for this to be plug and play for novice users so people that don't understand mr physics that don't have detailed understanding of mr hardware um, and obviously that's, you know, a lot of work for our team, but that is our intention. Great. I think, thank you for that. I think that's a really important um, uh, differentiation of the traditional MR technology and this technology and the, in the readability, I guess, and interpretability of the data being presented. So great. Um, Next question from Thomas Vincent. Uh, what is the size of the sweet spot? Um, also in terms of location, can we target any point of the brain? Um, yeah, so as far as the targeting is concerned, I have this extra slide. Um, and this is something we're actively working on. Um, the penetration depth is about five centimeters at the moment, five to eight centimeters. Um, the sweet spot itself is, it's fairly, uh, it's, um, it's, we can change that uh, by varying our RF uh, pulses, uh, but the largest one would probably be a, uh, uh, about five cc's that we can, we, can, we can acquire information from. So it's actually quite a large spot. And uh, as far as the positioning is concerned, yeah, we're you know, trying to use something like augmented reality to actually be able to position the sweet spot and the anatomy uh, overlay them so you know, people can actually target exactly where they, they think they're measuring. So just to add to that, there are quite comprehensive Emma atlases of the brain. So our knowledge of the spatial localization of various brain structures is very well known. And we have access to those atlases. And so what Sergey is showing here is that using augmented reality, we can combine, um, we can essentially overlay someone's either an average brain or an average brain calibrated for an individual's demographic characteristics, such as age, height, et cetera, factors that we know determine, um, you know, the, the dimensions of a human brain, male, female, et cetera. Um, so we can feed that information in and then use augmented reality to give you a visual sense of where you are positioned. That's, that's what, um, that's sort of one approach to this. Great. Thank you. I think, uh, that answer addressed, uh, Jeffrey Stout's question as well. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions here. So the next one is from Matthew Lewis. Um, 
What is the time resolution for some of these measures and how precise are they in terms of the field of view? Uh, precise in field of view? I'm not sure I understand that part, sorry. But um, the, um, just to give you an example, the, um, if you're doing just one measurement, we can measure it every 30 seconds. So for uh, tissue oxygenation, for example, we can do it really fast. Uh, for diffusion and perfusion, it takes a bit longer, so the resolution will be about um, two or three minutes. And when we combine all the all the parameters, what we have actually uh, done with the stroke, uh, we've been kind of doing um, playing it safe, and we've been uh, acquiring all three parameters every 15 minutes. Uh, but we can essentially uh, maybe half or a third that time. Okay, great. Um, and just one more question from uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Penare. Um, does the device allow for simultaneous measurements with transcranial Doppler ultrasound? We haven't tried that. Um, we have played around with the Lycox probes and uh, in years. Um, uh, haven't, haven't tried the transcranial Doppler. There could be interferences with because they both use RF, uh, look at the RF frequencies. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Sergey. Appreciate your contribution to the seminar today and, and also to Shek for helping out with those questions. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing the, up, the uh, upcoming developments of your technology. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Excellent. So uh, moving on now to the last um, the last presentation for today. Uh, so the next one is from Michelle Lacerenza. Uh, Michelle is from, uh, he's, he's the Chief Techn Technical Officer from Pioneers, which is based in Italy. And his presentation is Light Pulses for Reliable and Non-Invasive Brain Hemodynamic Measurements. So Michelle, I'll pass over to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting us as pioneers to this event. It's, I, I'm enjoying it a lot. I mean, those different techniques from MRI to transcr transcranial Doppler. And, and now we will talk a bit about light and the power of light to um, look inside our brain and our tissues in general. So Pioneers is a, um, is, is a company that was born uh, last year, and, but it's working uh, in, the, in the field of medicine with time domain years since, um, since 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And we, our aim is to deliver the new technology about time domain nears to the world. I'm going to give you a brief introduction about the um, about our journey. So our journey starts back in early 2000. Um, we started our research about time domain nears in 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 the university. We are based in Milan, so uh, the research started. Um, in collaboration, in a great collaboration between two departments, the physics and the electronic departments of Politecnico di Milano. Uh, after those 15 years of basic research and validation of the technique um, in vivo, so on, on humans, then we, we passed the uh, years from 2015 to 2019 um based um, on hardware developments so taking the um, hardware to the state of the art and shrinking the dimension of a, a time domain nearest device as much as possible and um, uh, lately we've been engineering uh, those devices and we've developed a um, commercial product that is now uh, on the market we are covering um, mainly Europe and United States right now, and, and we are trying to expand um, our market and our uh, and meet new users for this technique. We are supported by a very solid team of uh, researchers, uh, mainly from Politecnico di Milano, and also an industrial partner that is uh, focusing in. Uh, light retrieval and photons retrievals. We will talk about uh, photons mainly and the photons and how photons travel uh, in our tissues. So we are pretty far from each other and this kind of um, this kind of a virtual meeting are, are quite 
different from real life. So I'm going to try to come close closer to you by this small experiment. So we we are we are working with light, and I want you to I want just to to make a very quick experiment together uh, with the close with the light source that we have closer to to each other. So if you if you take your phone and and you turn on the um, the torch the torch light. Uh, we can have a hints of how light travels uh, in our tissue by uh, placing your finger onto the, the the torch of the phone. So you can see that from the light, from the white light that is coming out from from the phone, um, the light that we see traveling inside our uh, thumb or our fingers is coming like is lighting the finger in red. So what does it mean? Lights that some of the frequency of the light are absorbed are absorbed more than others, and most of all, it tells us that light can travel deep inside our our tissue. So uh, uh, our tissue and our brain are called uh, are um, diffusive media. So light scatters through them, and by um, studying how light travels inside. Our, our tissue, we can retrieve a lot um, of physiological parameters. With, so you might be uh, already um, expert or uh, keen with uh, nearest devices. Here, we are talking about time domain nearest. So it, it, it is quite a new technique and the technology is also is, is quite, is, is very new. And um, we are not talking about continuous wave like the torch of, uh, our, of our phone, but we are talking about lasers and pulsed lasers. Those lasers that we inject inside the tissue are completely not harmful and uh, are very, have got a very narrow um, time shape. So they are, it's called full width at half maximum. So they are width in time, it's around hundreds of picoseconds. So one of these pulses can stay more than hundred of billions of times inside just one second, just to give an idea. So photons is inject uh, this this light pulse is injected inside the tissues, and and then is retrieved some centimeters apart. Thanks to its modification time, so here we see that it was very sharp at the beginning, and uh, and now it's wider in time, and also in amplitude is changing. So for the difference from the blue and red curves, those are, those are real data coming out from, um, from the brain of a human subject. So thanks to those modification, we are able to retrieve what happens to the photons inside the brain. And uh, by doing that, thanks to the chromophores that in our case are um, oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin, we can calculate the concentration in micromolars per liter, so micromoles per liters and the tissue saturation and also the total hemoglobin that gives us an hint about the cerebral, the cerebral blood volume and blood, and blood flow. Um, what's very interesting about time domain nearest and what's made the, the difference between uh, time domain and continuous wave or frequency domain nearest is that the um, time arrival of the photons encodes the penetration depth. Um, or to which we are uh, looking at. So by, let, let's see what it means. Uh, if this is a pulse, a light pulse, and um, the early photons, the photons that are coming earlier at the detection site, um, traveled through the shallow layers of the brain, while the late photons arriving later, later in times bring us information about the deeper layers. And this enables us to disentangle the two information. That mainly means uh, being able to distinguish systemic variations, so superficial variations, um, and functional variation or hemodynamics deep inside the brain. The penetration depth um, reach up to uh, three centimeters inside uh, the brain. So here are some pro, some pro and cons with continuous wave nears that you might be more familiar with. Uh, the first one is the possibility of correcting, um, knowing the extracerebral variations uh, if we want to exactly know the um, deep hemodynamic 
um, behaviors of the brain. The second one is low sensitivity to motion artifacts. Why? Because we are um, we are looking at the shape of the laser pulse and not to the difference in uh, amplitude. And the, uh, the, the third one is related to the first one, and uh, it time domain nearest gives to us higher depth specificity, so we can know actually at what depth we are looking at. And as so, the the, the targets we are still uh, trying to hit is higher, hiring the sampling frequency, so the sampling rates up uh, like over um, ten hertz, and um still the uh, devices 10 domain nearest devices have the commercial ones have um low a low number of acquisition channels single or double acquisition channels right now some of the main applications are of course cerebral oximetry in particular long uh, long-term cerebral hemodynamic monitoring in particular um like specifically uh, pioneers product are known to be very stable in time and and this is very uh, useful when 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 you are like in intraoperative um environments and uh, surgical operation last more than two three and four hours uh, high reproducibility is another um, is, is another um, characteristics and uh, the ability of retrieving absolute concentration of oxy and deoxy hemoglobin. Other than long term monitoring, um, another application is functional brain activation. So thanks to the ability of disentangling disentangling the contribution of upper and lower layers. Um, time domain nearest is um, very good to um, monitoring functional brain activation depth up to three centimeters. And then another application is, by, is related to um, muscle oximetry and muscle metabolism. In particular, Pioneer's device that we will look at uh, uh, very soon is can be battery operated and it has got up to seven hour of lifetime. It is portable, it can be like wear as, uh, as a backpack and uh, measurements uh, are um are very and, and the measurements are quite rugged because because of its low sensitivity to motion artifacts so in muscle oximetry it can be used for uh, live monitoring during exercises on like uh, walking around or uh, deambulatory experiments or um like cycling like in these pictures or um it can be used and it is actually used in physiotherapy uh, for um uh, muscle assessment during rehabilitation so here is uh, our main product and it is called it is called nearest box and uh, it is designed and assembled in house um, we actually tailored all the the like the lasers and the detectors to meet um, the needs uh, related to muscle oximetry and brain um, brain uh, hemodynamic monitoring. It's compact. Uh, it is it has got the dimension of a a kind of medium sized book, like quite quite big actually. It weighs two point five kilos. And, um, and it can be tailored to specific applications. Um, we, we built in-house also the probes that are tailored for uh, muscle oximetry or cerebral oximetry. And it is meant to be as plug and play as possible. So um, our aim is actually to make time domain nears accessible and uh, in easy. And straightforward for measurements. So that's the medical uh, user interface that we um, that we have on the nearest box device, and it can give in real time uh, information about the concentration of oxygenated hemoglobin in red, deoxygenated hemoglobin in 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 blue, uh, total hemoglobin, and tissue saturation. And watch out because this is not peripheral blood saturation. So uh, we are not expecting uh, values like 95%, 96%, but it's related to the microvasculature. So it's the tissue saturation, and it is known to be less than the actual blood saturation because the oxygen, of course, has been uh, consumed. Um, so I want to, to walk you through some of um, um, 
some of our application and some of the studies that we are running in collaboration with universities here in Italy and in Switzerland and um, around Europe as well. So cerebral oximetry is the first um, application that we are going to look at in, in the specific of um, functional activations. So we try to tackle this, um, this problem related to um, gating disorders and um, walking dysfunctions. Uh, it is a, it is known to be a great um, a great problem, specific uh, mainly in the U.S. Uh, it involves um, uh, patients of like uh, suffering of Alzheimer, Parkinson, and multiple sclerosis, and it hits more than seventy five percent of the elderly population. Talking about people older older than seventy years old. And it's always, and it's um, most of the time is related to other physical debilitations, uh, risk of injuries, uh, depression related to fear of falling. And all of that involves more than 1% uh, one, 1 of the total expenses in the US. So it's an actual uh, problem. From, pre from previous literature, we've, um, we've of course uh, based our uh, studies on um, a previous MRI, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance um, studies, in which patients were asked to imagine um, forward walking and backward walking to see what um, area of the brain was activating during those two tasks. And they saw that the actual barycenter of this activation was at around 2.5 uh, centimeters depth, and the activation of backward walking in that region of the brain um, was much higher in, um, in when people were imagining backward walking with respect to forward walking. So as a pilot study, we decided to um, look at this particular region and measure different subjects while they were actually walking. So it was to our knowledge, the first time that um, like um, humans were monitored during um, free, like monitored in freely walking experiments. So the, the, um, the device was worn as a backpack and the fiber, the optical fibers together with the probe uh, were placed on the um, C1 position uh, related to e e EEG um, 1020 mapping system. So the protocol was, um, was as, follows, as follows, 20 second baseline, 20 second task and 40 second recovery and was repeated five times. We asked the subject first to walk forward, repeated five times, and then to walk backwards on a straight line. And then as a control, we asked them to stand still, even if we were giving them the start and stop signal. The results were um, great. And uh, what we saw was that in the control condition, we didn't see any activation. So here um, you have the uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin dynamic in blue and deoxygenated hemoglobin dynamic in red. And as you can see, you have absolute uh, concentration values. We're talking about micromolars. Um, the gray areas are the activation period, so the um, the task period when the, the subject were actually walking. In the forward walking tasks, those are the results from one subject in um, in particular. Um, we see that we can near we can um, we can find the activation. So we we expect an, uh, the the response related to the inactivation is an increase of oxygenated hemoglobin in a, and a decrease of the oxygenated hemoglobin. And the increase of oxygenated hemoglobin was very clear in each one of the tasks. So this, this was monitored uh, real time and uh, we were looking at the deeper layer of the um, motor cortex related to the lower limb area of the subjects. While when we were looking at the backward walking task, we, we saw that the activation was nearly doubled in nearly all the, um, the repetitions. And that was great because it, um, it was like a, a in vivo and in um, ecological environment uh, proof of what was seen in previous fMRI studies. Another application is more related to um, difference between systemic variations and uh, functional um, variation deeper in the brain. 
So here the protocol was different. We monitored the um, the hemodynamics of upper layer and lower layer of the brain in those two tasks. So the standing task and the sitting task. You might be familiar with the sit to stand protocol where the subject are asked, are asked to um, stand up from a chair and then sit down later on. So the, the protocol was five seconds of baseline, five seconds of, of task, uh, around five seconds. So uh, most of the, of the subjects took less than five seconds to stand up and sit down and then resting for 20 seconds. Um, those two tasks were repeated five times and we were um, we placed the probe um, um, in the in two different positions. We were using two devices coupled together and synchronized and we were looking um, at the um, motor uh, cortex uh, area and the uh, prefrontal um, uh, cortex. Why the prefrontal cortex? Because we didn't expect um, any significant activations, um, functional activation related to the sitting and standing uh, task. Um, and for each of the two uh, position, we divided um, the information we retrieved in upper or extracerebral um, layer and lower layer deeper inside the brain. So those are uh, the results for um, the sitting and standing task in the prefrontal cortex area. And what we saw in the lower layer was kind of expected. So we actually uh, didn't see any clear uh, or any significant activation in the region of the um, task. That is this one in, in the middle of the dashed lines, dashed lines. And while what we saw in the upper layer as systemic variations um, was a clear um, increase of total hemoglobin, so uh, um, volume uh, in this re particular region of the brain during the sitting task and a decrease in the total hemoglobin during the standing task. So to, um, to retrieve the total hemoglobin, we just sum up the oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And this can give us an hint about the, the, the variation in blood volume. Uh, let's move to the other um, side of the brain that we were monitoring, that is the um, motor cortex. So what we saw here was uh, pretty much the same results that we got um, in the prefrontal cortex for what concerned the systemic variations in the upper layer. So an increase of total hemoglobin in the sitting uh, task and a decrease of total hemoglobin, mainly the oxygenated hemoglobin in the standing task. But we were also able to see uh, clear activations during the uh, sitting task and uh, some hint of activation in the standing task. Those results are averaged over the five repetitions. And we measured in total uh, 17, not 16 subjects. So, and, and we found out that the, uh, those results are, um, are very reproducible between different subjects. So in one of the um, features of uh, the time domain of our time domain years device that I would like to stress is um, variations and reproducibility. So the, um, the reproducibility of the measurements that is related to the coefficient of variations in different repeated measurements. On, in this first um, uh, trial, we wanted to um, demonstrate that the uh, variation in the retrieval of uh, coefficients of absorption and scattering that are the um, phys physical parameter that makes us able to retrieve oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin was very low. So reproducibility was very high. And we, made, um, we measured a tissue mimicking phantom that um, that has got the same optical properties of uh, human tissue um, a lot of times during um, during one month. And we saw that, that, that the variation between the different measurements was lower than 2.4% uh, for uh, mu S and 1% for the coefficient of absorption. On the other end, we um, we tested the reproducibility in vivo, uh, in this case on the forearm, by replacing uh, 10 times the probe in the same place 
um, in a time span of three minutes. And we saw that for all the param for all the um, parameter that we were monitoring, the physiological parameter, the coefficient of variation was always less than uh, 3.5%. Um, so our time domain nearest device um, is able to retrieve absolute, oxygenate, ox, uh, absolute um, oxygenated hemoglobin concentration, deoxygenated hemoglobin, total hemoglobin, tissue saturation, but um, it can give just an hint, an hint about the, the, the blood flow. And the step forward uh, that uh, we are making right now um, together with other scientists around the world is merging uh, these time domain nearest technologies with other optical techniques, for example, uh, diffuse correlations spectroscopy. And uh, with that uh, other um, technology, we can retrieve interesting parameters such as oxygen extraction index and uh, absolute um, blood flow in, the, in, in, different, in different tissue. This is a European project that was founded a couple of years ago. It's called Baby Looks, and in this project, they were uh, they um, they are merging time domain years with um, with the uh, um, with DCS, so diffuse correlation spectroscopy. And in this particular um, clinical studies, they are looking at the uh, cerebral blood flow and uh, cerebral blood saturation of, um, of newborns baby um, that need um, transfusion. So uh, that need, um, so they, once they born, may, uh, those those babies are uh, premature. So they, they were born before the um, uh, the date it was um, that they were that they had to, uh, let's say, and uh, they needed uh, cerebral blood transfusion because um, the the actual. Um, oxygenation of the tissue was not, of the end of the blood, was not efficient enough. So um, in, for those babies, uh, the, the aim here was to find the, uh, an actual threshold to decide when um, the transfusion was actually needed or, uh, or when it was not. Uh, the study is ongoing and, um, and it's in collaboration with uh, Fumagalli Hospital in Milan. And, is, and, and now the measurements are uh, performed by Politecnico di Milano here in Italy. So babies were um, measured before transfusion, during transfusion and after transfusions. Here we have some uh, preliminary results about total hemoglobin and tissue saturation um, of those babies before and after transfusions. And, and so you can see here that we have also the tissue oxygen extraction and blood flow index. In this case, um, we see that total hemoglobin is increasing uh, after uh, transfusion and together with the tissue saturation, while the oxygen extraction is uh, decreasing. Well, we have a pretty constant blood flow uh, index um, before and after. So with this, I, I with that I finished um, my presentation. Uh, here you have some contacts and my email and our website and some social media channels. And I thank you for your attention. I'm open to any question and please feel free to ask me whatever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for a, for a great presentation. Um, do we have a question from uh, Ronnie Penare? Uh, what is the temporal resolution between measurement samples? So, okay, uh, the temporal resolution between like one measurement and the other can go up to uh, 10 Hertz. Usually what we, what we use to have a high signal to noise ratio is staying between uh, one to four Hertz. So having um, one actual point of oxygenated, deoxygenated and saturation value uh, twice or uh, four times in a second. Okay, great. Um, just while we wait for other questions to come through, I had a couple for you. So it looks like um, on one of your studies, you're measuring not just from the frontal lobe, but also assessing the motor cortex. Um, so your the probes can actually be placed in different regions of the brain. Is that right? Yes, the probe okay. can be placed. 
in i mean wherever in, mm -hmm. in, in on on the brain and we usually follow the eeg 1020 system mapping system to uh, select the region that um we want to 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 measure okay. and in, in in one of these study we used two different devices so two channels and we had the possibility to monitor the prefrontal cortex and the motor cortex at the same time while synchronizing the acquisition okay and so do you need to have a region that does not have hair to be able to put that that probe on top or the the sensor on top actually um so this was uh, a big problem uh, in in the past and we we tackled this problem by developing uh, tailored probes and of course the hair lowered the signal intensity but by um, by improving the probes we managed to make measurements also uh, on people like me mm -hmm. or people um, or like uh, women mm -hmm. and with long hairs and black hairs so uh, mm -hmm. those 17 sub those 16 subjects that we measured in the in the study that I showed before were um, mixed so uh, they, they had different hairs and different hairs length mm -hmm. and different air color okay that that seems to be a, limited a, to sorry i was just going to say that seems like a novel application then because most of the systems that we use that are out there you need kind of a, a bare skin rather than having hair um for that yeah. that light to penetrate through so great um yes. ronnie panare has another question does the device have analog outputs uh, yes, uh, we are developing uh, right now the analog output because uh, um, a couple of clients asked us to implement it and it will be available very, very soon. Uh, so probably in the next in the next month or so. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Um, another question from Nick Elleveld. Um, he says, thank you. Uh, we use a continuous way of NIRS device in our research. What is the advantage of the time domain NIRS over the spatial resolution spectroscopy or other techniques that aim to remove the extra cerebral contamination for the continuous wave NIRS? Okay, so the advantages are um, so are kind of uh, a lot. So one of the first one, so the first one is um, the ability to um, disentangle the information of uh, upper um, um, uh, upper hemodynamics and deeper hemodynamics with just one channel. So usually in continuous wave NIRS, you need more channels, different interfiber distance to monitor um, upper layer and lower layers and so correct for it. While in time domain NIRS, uh, as we saw, um, uh, photon arrival times encodes penetration depth. So we can use just one uh, probe, one single source detector separation and have um, different information about upper layer and lower layer. The second, uh, um, the second pro is low sensitivity to motion artifacts. So we are, we are not relying on the photon counts, the difference in photon counts for retrieving the um, concentration of oxygenated, deoxygenated hemoglobin, but we are relying on the shape of the laser pulse. And the shape of the laser pulse doesn't change much if you are moving around the probe. Uh, as, so the, the results you see um, on, in the in the walking protocol where where the subject were actually wearing the device as a backpack and they were walking uh, on a straight line. Um, were not filtered, so we didn't we didn't use any filter to remove motion artifacts. And uh, as you might know, filtering uh, continuous wave data is one of the major issue when it comes to freely moving um, freely moving uh, experiments. And so, and as yes, the other the other main um, pro is the ability of retrieving absolute values. So um, we are not measuring difference from the baselines in our experiments, but we are measuring um, the actual concentration of oxygenated hemoglobin. 
for example, it is uh, on my brain, it is uh, 74 micromolars and 32 micromolars of deoxygenated hemoglobin, while on someone else's brain might be slightly different. And uh, if it is more than uh, a threshold, then it, it could be a problem. So uh, those absolute um, value measures are uh, one of our strengths as well. Okay, great. Um, so Nick responds, he says, agreed, we have encountered many movement artifacts in our CW data. So he thanks you for the, the response there. Um, I have a follow-up yeah. question, Michelle, in terms of the, the outputs that you're getting from that single, that single detector. Um, how, how many depths are you able to extract out of that, that single signal? So um, in right now, what we are using is, so it depends on the method, uh, on the physical model, the, on how you physical, physically model the brain, for example. And you can make different, um, um, different models. You can, um, can, you, can, um, you can say that your brain is made of um, two layers, three layers, four layers, and then you adapt the uh, model to your assumptions. Uh, what we find, what we found, find to be a great trade-off uh, right now for some of the application, mainly functional application or long-term monitoring application, is to uh, divide the models in upper and lower layers, so a B-layer model. And we found it to be a good trade-off in terms of um, um, uh, signal processing um, effort and um, accuracy in the results that we get. So this is the main model that we use and we divide ac the actual uh, depth that is three centimeters in a upper layer and lower layer. But in, in principle, you can, uh, if you have a four layer uh, model or if you assume that your, the thing that you are measuring is, is made of four layers, then you can build up a theoretical model to make um, different layers and to retrieve those information in different layers. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that response. Okay, um, so I don't think we have any more questions in the chat for now. So um, I think we'll just wrap it up. Thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate your contribution to this seminar. Um, and I'd like to thank all of thank the- you. I'd like to thank all of the presenters today. So um, Adam, uh, Sergey, and Shek, and also to Michelle. Um, I think this was a, a novel uh, contribution to our seminar series and introducing us to some new technologies that are available for our research. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna quickly show everyone the uh, slide for our next seminar. Um, so we have this scheduled for October 8th um, at 10 a.m. U.S. Central Time. So this will be chaired by Ryan Hoyland, Hannah Coldwell, and Kate Thomas. And it will be uh, very clinically focused um, with the keynote speaker is Mapinda Sekon. Um, and he'll be presenting on the clinical insights into ischemic uh, brain injury pathophysiology in humans. And this will be followed by three abstract talks um, from Ryan, from Anthony Bain, and Travis Givens, um, focused again around uh, the um, ischemic brain injury and also some potential treatments in terms of heat and cold stress or cold uh, stimuli. So uh, we look forward to those presentations on October 8th. And thanks everyone for joining us today.